Uh, first of all, thank you, Jurgen and, and Robert uh, and the DAC organizing committee for giving this opportunity to come and talk to you all. Uh, so let me start my talk with a, with a first little bit, I would say, sense of optimism. If you look at the electronics revolution in general, uh, I think when we look from our vantage point of the industry, I think we will see an, another explosion over the next decade. We just see tremendous amount of growth in everything we do in our lives from the time we get up to the time we go to sleep and in the uh, environment around us. So, so really there is a tremendous room to innovate over the next uh, decade and we will see a dramatic change in the amount of electronics which is uh, intersecting our lives. And with that backdrop, let me also kind of put a challenge from an overall point of view, uh, from an EDA industry point of view. I mean, this is 50 year of DAC, and I think huge amount of innovation has gone in over the last 50 years. And a lot of the uh, fundamental problems, uh, I think the, the industry has done a great job in, in addressing. But when you look next decade, from my perspective, I think we are really focused, we're at a kind of a crossover point where we really need to look at this problem of how do we solve more or bring these disparate technologies to put a more arresting new hole. In, in kind of a high level view, not just the parts, how do we optimize the sum? How do we look at the system picture? And hopefully that's what I will walk you through in the next 30 minutes to give a picture of that. So I'll be focusing on really coming from the infrastructure side, the embedded processing in, in the systems. This industry is about a $12 billion industry today and, and growing very dramatically. And if you look at any general embedded system, whether from a Nest thermostat to all the way to complex base stations, uh, the, the composition is there is an embedded processing engine in the middle and a lot of technologies around it in terms of really your amplifiers, your A to D, D to A converters, your clocks, timers, interfaces, and all that. And, and, and these systems really have a lot of requirements around performance, power, but also in terms of safety, reliability, and all. For example, when you look at your automotive, the braking systems and all, the ASLB requirements, the fit rate requirements are, are very, very intense. You don't want your car to be really misjudging or misfiring at, at critical junctures in, in, in time. So how we put all this together is, is really the crux in being able to, to grow and, and really explore this, this space in this industry. And I'll be taking uh, you through a journey from a base station point of view to kind of put in perspective how this all comes together. So, and, and, and really beyond base station, we are really, from infrastructure point of view, ad addressing uh, these embedded systems across a number of spaces from automotive, industrial, uh, video, and so forth. Um, to put another perspective, typically when we go address a particular market and we want to build this platform and devices, to start from a gate, it's a $100 million plus investment to, to even potentially even think of addressing a market. So, really the time and energy investment required to make the systems happen and the growing complexity is, is really going out of proportion. So one of the challenge for, for you all is how to really make it easy to bring the systems together and really from a productivity and time to market point of view. If you look at a, a, a typical uh, heterogeneous uh, network today or from a base station point of view, like Scott was saying, Today, there are about uh, 6 billion mobile subscriptions. And according to a recent uh, mobility report from Ericsson, uh, just last week actually, uh, it's, supposed, uh, it's expected to grow in the next five years to about 9.1 billion. Uh, today, there are about, in terms of uh, human users, about 4.5 billion users. Uh, when you look at from a smartphone space point of view, uh, today there are about a billion uh, smartphones being used in this network and uh, about actually 1.2 billion to be precise uh, as of end of 12. And it took five years to go to 1 billion or 1.2 billion smartphones. The next billion smartphones will be added in the next just two years. And in fact, by 2018, it's expected the number of smartphones uh, will be around 4.5 billion. So what is due to the network? The expected growth of network capacity over the next five years is expected to be 12x from what we have today. And about 46% of that will be mobile, uh, really, uh, traffic on these networks. So what that kind of gives a picture is the complexity of these networks in be able to handle and give a very seamless user experience is, is tremendous. I think many of you, if you don't get the, the, the demand or, or, or really the performance of your phone, 
you very quickly call your operators and obviously not very happy with that. So partly behind the scenes, we are busy trying to figure out how to make the user experience uh, much more uh, really enjoyable. And that's where the, uh, the networks are, are really becoming very heterogeneous. Uh, the macro base stations, uh, if you look at, are very, very complex to deploy, and a lot of OPEX from AT&T's and, and T-Mobile's of the world point of view, they spend billions of dollars every year. So they cannot go afford to spend another 12x of that over the next five years. And that's where the industry is going through an innovation of looking at introducing this notion of small cells uh, in this, and making these heterogeneous networks in terms of being able to get to the required capacities. And further, if you look at the topologies of these networks, there are a number of elements. Typically, we are familiar with these macro base stations, these big towers, and the electronics underneath them. Soon you will start seeing a lot of these what we call small cells on a light pole inside this, in this uh, room here uh, on, on, on a flagpole, uh, potentially even your homes, uh, which will be really part of this overall network and being able to, to really work seamlessly across uh, these different platforms. And then also you have what we call backhaul technologies. These are really the behind the scenes connecting your macro base station small cell through a line of sight or non-line of sight uh, point to point communication, either wireline or wireless, connecting back to the core networks or to the internet. So the, the, the topologies of this system and the different configurations of these calls to go through uh, these networks is, is pretty complex. And you can imagine for us to provide solutions to fit the various different form factors from a macro level to small cell uh, to, to really backhaul is tremendous. And then the software on top of that to enable this kind of a network uh, architectures is very significant. And that's where, from an industry point of view, we are trying to, to really see how we bring this value uh, and, and being able to, uh, in an in a R&D we can afford, provide the solutions to address this 12x growth over the next five years. So if you look at a, a traditional base station architecture, uh, relatively straightforward in terms of really from a user point of view, you have your, your antennas, your amplifiers, your analog front ends, and, and, and really the baseband processing, and then on top of that, your layer two, layer three transport, and control plane and power management. And uh, both from a transmit and receive point of view, at a base station level, we tend to optimize depending on multiple standards and, and bandwidth requirements and so forth. Uh, today, traditionally, you're seeing 3G as, as, as a dominant standard. LTE is, is growing very fast. In fact, it's expected to be 60% of uh, uh, traffic will be LTE by 2018. And LTE today is uh, offering up to uh, download speeds of 300 megabit per second, up, upload of 75. LTE Advanced, which is the next generation, is already uh, in release 10, uh, taking uh, good shape, which will allow up to a gigabit per second download and half a gig upload. So you can imagine the amount of capacity and performance we are talking over, over air. And so base stations, really we look at how do we offer that kind of a multi-standard uh, solutions in a very tight power footprint and being able to meet these different network topologies. And if you look at this with this backdrop, how the base stations have evolved over the last uh, uh, 10 years or so. So in about 2000, uh, when we uh, really started our journey in base stations, uh, there were about 30 different components uh, and different suppliers on the board, from your typical modulators, demodulators, to baseband processing, IO switching, layer two CPU controls, and uh, management functions and all. And the, the number of semiconductor supplier, the contents, the integration was, was very, very daunting. Uh, and as we evolved over time, we really tried to, because TI being a, a traditional signal processing company, it was a very, uh, kind of a uh, home turf for us to go integrate the entire basement processing uh, and, and modem function into a chip. And then we reduced from about 30 to about 10 different components on a board and a system. And then as the demand for, for capacity in the network started increasing, we started adding more capacity uh, in terms of being multi-cores and being able to offer a lot more channels and users uh, experience really in terms of a devices. So that was the time you saw just going from a frequency curve to a multi-core curve to offer more capacity in the systems. And then the journey continued. We started even all the IO switching functions in terms of really your, 
your uh, network backplanes, your, your switchings and interface standards all started getting integrated into, into a single chip. And then even the management functions, et cetera, all along with the layer two, layer three, transport and control started getting integrated to devices. And, and finally, really, we are uh, putting an entire base station in a chip. In fact, yesterday we announced, and I'll show a high-level slide on a two-chip solution to entire, build an entire base station and being able to deploy multi-standard uh, uh, network architectures. So really, this journey has been very interesting over the last decade in terms of going from, I would say, uh, typical devices in 2000 were about 40, 50 million transistors to today we are talking uh, about th three billion transistors on these devices. And we see this integration trend and capacity trend and multi-standard trend continuing uh, for a while. So beyond, now kind of looking at it from a different angle, really, when you look at these kind of complex systems, what are they made of? I mean, really, how do you put all this together? Uh, at a very high level, really, again, there are a lot of foundational technologies. Obviously, the, the Moore's Law scaling, we believe strongly it'll continue for a while and we will take advantage of that. Uh, power management, et cetera, very, very fundamental. I mean, really, and I'll show more system view of power, how we are looking, the EDA design methodologies, and really the safety, reliability, and how do you put all these pieces together from an integration point of view? So if you look at big view, uh, there is a lot of control processing, number of cores, uh, risk cores, different kind of cores we put in the systems to be able to handle a lot of the control function, and then a, a tremendous amount of signal processing, whether it's a DSP processing traditional two vector processors to applica application specific uh, configurable acceleration, whether programmable or configurable, and then a lot of system level in terms of network, in terms of switching, and IOs. Because as you start increasing the number of cores, the memory bandwidth requirement on chip, off chip, and the IO bandwidth requirements are dramatically increasing in these systems. And we see the integration trend. Uh, typically, you see the DDR performance going up your Ethernet performance going up, but now really integrating that memory on chip or bringing it closer through wide IOs, et cetera, we see that trend continues. And the key is how do you put all these different technologies together and being able to offer that in an overall platform uh, back to my $100 million plus investment to, to birth any of these platforms. That's where we start thinking, how do you bring these platforms together and then how do you get economy of scale in being able to offer different solutions? And so really that's where uh, in, in Texas Instruments we have this uh, Keystone platform which we are leveraging over the last decade and, and continue to evolve uh, addressing these broader market spaces and all. At a very simple system level, really we are taking a very system view, domain view of, uh, uh, of this overall platform. And there are some fundamental technologies in terms of really the, you can kind of think of the backbone because there's a lot of data streaming going on on these devices from various sources or destinations. So we have a lot of intelligence in terms of what we call multi-core navigator, um, which is a mechanism to schedule and, and manage data flow in these devices. And then non-blocking architecture to be able to put these different source and destinations to make a system. And then in terms of compute, really putting RISC and DSP cores and different memory architectures, topologies, different levels of caches, how do you go optimize that? So we really look at that as, as a domain space we fit into this platform. And then a lot of uh, application-specific uh, acceleration with the radio, multimedia, industrial, how do you incorporate into this platform? And similarly, a lot of security, reliability uh, aspects uh, in these uh, systems. And finally, a lot of uh, uh, networking kind of technologies are permeating into these systems. Uh, in terms of package switched architectures, switches, et cetera, all getting in integrated. And not to mention all kinds of uh, IO interface technologies, whether it's antenna standards from CPRI, OPSI, to your PCI evolution, to your DDR evolutions, and, and so forth. And, and really the goal is to build this platform which is highly integrated, scalable, and but being able to offer exceptional uh, performance and power um, uh, results out of this. And in addition to this uh, platform, much like Scott was saying, we see a tremendous synergy required from a software perspective. As you would expect, these systems are becoming so complex that if we don't have the accompanying software and make them very easy to use and deploy, it'll take forever to get the systems out in the market. So really, we TI today, for example, employs more software people than hardware people, and really offering the entire stack all the way from your base 
what we call multi-core SDK, where you offer uh, device drivers, your, your base libraries, your high-level operating systems to really the, the debug layer in terms of being off, able to offer real-time visibility into the systems and high-level OSs and even supporting multi-core uh, OpenMP, OpenCL, et cetera, uh, systems to be able to get value out of these systems. So software is, is a very, very big key in this puzzle. And so with that backdrop, this is a, actually a device which we just uh, introduced yesterday uh, at the Small Cell Summit in, in London. And a this is uh, offering basically, uh, sorry, uh, a full PoE solution, power over Ethernet, um, for supporting multi-standard 128 users and it is capable for even supporting LTE advance, which is 40 megahertz uh, spectrum. The LTE is up to 20 uh, megahertz, but this device supports up to 40 megahertz system, integrated ethernet switching and acceleration all the way from antenna to, to transport. And in fact, the next slide shows, this is the entire base station in a, in a small box. You can almost visualize this uh, as a Wi-Fi box with a, with a two chip solution, uh, along with just basic clocking and, and other components and we put an antenna on top and just an ethernet cable running which, which is both your, your transport as well as your power and being able to deploy the systems uh, at a very cost effective way. This is how I think the industry will go address uh, uh, really the next uh, 12x increase in terms of the overall system capacity. And here there is also a lot of innovation in terms of how you look at the whole system power envelope and some of the techniques which we have done in terms of being able to do a lot of the digital radio front end in terms of really power and being able to highly optimize between baseband and the transceiver, uh, putting new technologies in terms of di uh, digital pre uh, crest factor reduction to overall reduce the power requirements of these systems. So extremely important to, to really look at this picture from a system view and being able to build uh, this class of solutions. And you can take this concept really beyond base station. Really, we are seeing the trend in cloud computing, uh, video infrastructure space, uh, medical imaging, industrial automation, uh, radars, where the, the more we can understand the domain, the more we can think of that domain in terms of really that particular space, the better we can address as a solution. And that's where when I started this whole journey, the system level view of the problem and how do you bring these various pieces together is, is very, very fundamental. And not just base stations, really, we are taking this concept uh, uh, further uh, to the next level. For example, this is uh, another dimension to this whole thing, uh, what we are calling a purpose-built server. So today, traditional servers are there uh, in terms of really uh, uh, the backbones of your internet and, and various other uh, uh, compute applications. But this is a view which we, uh, we actually just uh, recently uh, worked with HP and announced uh, HP started this very ambitious program called Moonshot, and the idea is to build purpose-built servers. So instead of using traditional um, CPU engines, here we, there's an example we are using one of our devices in 28 nanometer to be able to do uh, a cartridge which is taking about one-tenth the power of a traditional uh, server cartridge and be able to offer 10x performance compared to the traditional uh, uh, engines. So this is where how the industry will address power issue on the server side in terms of whether it's in oil and gas exploration or media processing, video infrastructure, and so forth. So really we see this notion of domain understanding and applying that domain to a particular space having a huge impact in terms of really what we can offer as a solution. And now kind of really walk you through these different spaces what are the complexities we are seeing as, as we try to continue this journey of these system evolutions? At a big picture level, really, there, there are a few. One is, even from an IP perspective, if you look at these, our devices, there is just a myriad of IPs from processing elements to uh, uh, basically diff interfaces to many other technologies. And so there is an industry ecosystem which has to come together. For us, a lot of uh, differentiated technologies built inside, but we also tend to buy a lot. The key challenge from the industry is how to make these IPs easy to use, integrate, and deploy. So that's where uh, I, I think uh, many of you in the room really need to, to figure out how really we build this open platform architectures and being able to diff integrate these different technologies. Power management, whether static or dynamic, continues to be a, a huge issue. 
The only thing I would, I would, I would say on power is not just think from a, from a device level or, or a block level or board, think from a system and a board level, much like the small cell example I was giving, where we were not just optimizing the baseband, but also trying to optimize the RF transceiver and looking at even the power amplifier and really from a system level, how do we reduce the power? So that's where I think the, the next really journey on power is, is how do we squeeze the power out of these systems? And then another notion, as these devices are getting very big, we loosely call pay proportional to use. How do we get much like clocking, clock gating, et cetera, almost take it to that level where we have power management more at a micro power gating level built into hardware and dynamically taking advantage of the hardware instead of putting that all problem in the software. Because one of that problem with power management we see is we can do a lot of things, but if you move a lot of that complexity in software to take advantage, we tend to really not get the full entitlement of the system. And then a lot of the system management. These are highly asynchronous systems. So really the DFT architectures to go address these spaces, the clocking, uh, the interrupt, the interconnect fabrics, et cetera. How do we really bring all these systems and pieces together? There's a tremendous amount of room for innovation and impact of this space. And finally, again, back to the board team, the board level integration uh, in these platforms, uh, really looking at whether it's power management related, PMX, A to D, D to D converters, much like the digital front ends I was talking earlier in the small cell base stations, et cetera. So this board level integration uh, coming into devices, whether on chip or in, on package, uh, continues to be a, a big, big trend we see going forward. And if you really now look at two different angles, this complexity, one is from a implementation, another from a verification. Um, again, really the, the, the time to market, the R&D efficiency is fundamental. So much like I was saying earlier, really, the, the pieces of the technology exist. It's the user experience in terms of being able to integrate them well and being able to offer the productivity continues to be a challenge, whether it's really from a simple thing like your, your constraints uh, in, in your designs because of the disparate nature of IPs, the complexity, how do we make it easy and make it predictable to close these uh, uh, designs. Uh, from a block perspective, again, whether it's your wire optimization, your correlation through the flow, how do we really make that problem easy where I'm not spending 10 designers on, on, on a piece of design or spending 10 months, rather these designs, I have to, billions of transistors, the maximum span we are looking is 12 to 18 months. And on some of the, the derivative de designs, the goals are six to nine months to go from really start to end in this device's journey. Power management, I think enough said, really we have to look at a system level problem and how do we go, go basically squeeze the, the uh, power out of the systems. And design robustness, I think again, with the scaling of technologies, mixing technologies, and really particularly, we see the Moore's Law trend continuing. How do we get our designs robust and being able to handle uh, this level of integration uh, going forward? From a verification perspective, really uh, much like Scott was saying earlier, this continuum all the way from starting from an IP level and looking at the entire system, and then all the platforms along the way from your simulators to your HAPS boards to your, your, your emulators in terms of your quick turns and, and so forth, and Zebus to system level, uh, we have to find a path to easily migrate these designs up and down very quickly. And then if you look at the, the various problems, when you're looking from manufacturing system level and all the way from an IP system, so kind of looking at both views and looking at these platforms, how do we make it where from a resource intensive uh, point of view, a cost in intensive in terms of really the number of uh, servers we have in our platform or in our, in our farms to be able to run this kind of simulations, we have to find ways to, to really compress cycle time and also being able to run more vectors and at different levels of robustness and application performance, not just from IP and directed test level. So I think the, the, the verification challenge in these complex systems uh, really continues to scale and we as industry need to make sure uh, how do we keep a address this uh, going forward. Um, in conclusion, really one thing which is, I think the industry, like I said, is trying to really get arms around, at least we feel uh, we, we have learned our lessons, is that system knowledge in these uh, systems as we look is very, very key. What that means also is really that you need to have your strategy, how you're going to address these markets and domains and, and really bring all the pieces together. 
And the key thing is then really because back to that 100 million plus investment required, you'll have to figure out where you'll spend your dollars and time in terms of optimization. And, and really let your ROI be your guide. Don't just focus on optimization at an at a, at a, uh, uh, individual entity level, but focus from a system that are you optimizing a part or you're optimizing the sum. So that is very, very key, really, and, and, and foundational for us to, to deliver these kind of uh, complex systems going forward. And if you look at from a f uh, future point of view, the time to market of these complex systems is, is just becoming very, very critical. So that's where we have to make these complex systems very easy to use and deploy. And that means at every level, whether I'm developing them at a IP level, system level, verifying them, or physically building them, we got to figure out how to be able to do a lot more with a lot fewer people. And then even deploying, whether the software, hardware aspect, system aspect, board aspect, uh, I think we have to figure out how to pull all this together. And scaling of the systems up and down, all the way from wearable electronics to very low power to these complex base stations and high performance compute systems will continue. So we have to figure out how to span that spectrum all the way from really uh, nano energy to, to really these uh, advanced systems. And we have to squeeze power out of the systems. In, in a typical base station, very simple, a third is electricity, third is real estate, and third is everything else. So if we remove power or, or improve the power of the system, we make a huge impact uh, overall in terms of really the cost, capex, opex of these deploying these systems. And I think the, the, the scaling uh, trend of technology will continue. And, and I think we, we absolutely intend to take advantage of that. Having said that, I think the, the industry has a challenge how to really bring that from a cost point of view uh, more, more, more uh, interesting uh, to, to the manufacturers. Today, as we see the scaling trends, the cost definitely is not appealing. I think the power and performance still, we have legs to go. With that, thank you very much.